Thank you very much. And I'd just uh, like to start by um, referring to a colleague who, who recently said that I think when we when we use theory, we are not just you know taking it from social science and applying it on to the material, um, but we also affect theory we're using just a little a little push somewhere, even when it's something as unimportant as some curbstones from which are not very pretty from a remote place in Scandinavia. I think we are. When we are using theory, we are doing it. Something. I think she's right. So I think but yeah, I think we're doing something to it. Um, so what I'll say um, is related to a research project which I'm uh, running uh, together with uh, Rebecca Cannell, who's a postdoc who works with uh, mounds combining geoarchaeology, new materialism, as Tina Brunster, who works with runestone, trying to work with placemaking and assembly the theory, and then myself, who's looking into ship settings, curbstones. And oh, can't see the like it. Um, and the temporality of horse. Um, so, so we're also trying to look into to, to our colleagues. The the research project uh, and 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 how certain types of objects live on and, and change the top. Um It's a four year um, project run by Norwegian Region uh, Research Council where we try to look into how and why the past was used um, so very very actively in Viking Scandinavia. Mid the ninth to mid eleventh century, so we are somewhere in the late Anglo-Saxon early medieval period, yeah. and we're looking into to monuments and the strategies of commemoration, but also choices of objects. Um, and and you you could say why we turn to study of the past. The past weren't we done with that in the nineteen nineties? So we had uh, particularly in in British uh, New Wrong States research, we were looking into uh, various <coughs> types of um, of use of the cultural landscape. Um, I, I, well, we are, we are not uh, done with it. I'll, I'll try to, to show you why. Um, I think partly it's because uh, using the past is about relationality, about creating relations across uh, time. So so we work with this, this placemaking concept um, and, and we also try to focus on the, the effects and capacities in relation to reuse and reinterpretation of monuments sites and, and artifacts and I'll come back to, to the why return which is also linked to a question of power so I'm very happy with, uh, with Rachel's uh, presentation here, here today but first I want to say something about time temporality uh, that uh, I think we still constantly work with this linear time concept somewhere it's, it's, it's what we do and then if we're very, very fancy, we also work in the circular times, you know. So and it doesn't really help anything, does it? Um, I very much like this uh, illustration from Aileen Engstrom's uh, <coughs> thesis, which Elizabeth uh, just spoke, uh, pointed out to me um, a few years ago, where she is looking into how the same location is uh, being uh, reused, rediscovered, reinterpreted, so many times, so this timeline might look very different if you try to see uh, these these various uh, snapshots. I also think that I, and perhaps other than me, uh, very much like when we read Laura and Olivier's uh, The Dark Abyss of Time, uh, the remindedness of the past that is so very present in this room, and, and when we're constantly dealing with material remains, so they are not just in the past, they are also contemporary um, among us and, and that also is, is linked to, to relationality in some manner. Um, I think that um, when it comes to, to power, uh, very often when we are talking about the past and the past, then uh, the uh, concept of power which is being used is still a structural Marxist concept of uh, that power is used to legitimate, that, that material culture is used to legitimize power so it's a it's a very f flat way of understanding power um uh, and it it includes um it's in it's very <coughs> strong like it's archaeology this is how you see power um but it's i think also in studies of the past the past and this includes um some kind of deceit uh that someone is being lured and we can just use our material culture to trick someone um which i, I think is is very very far away from from understanding people's self-perception that, that most people who do anything believes in them while, while doing it. Um, but I still 
think that this uh, this perception of of power um, is is very strong in at least in, in traditional Viking Age research. Um, and then in the last 20 years, we've moved from power to agency, so we shouldn't have a problem, should we? Only um, when we look at how the agency discussion has been going on, I think it's like it's been like a game of old maid. Um, in Scandinavian languages, uh, that game is called Black Peter, so it's a synonym for. So what we're f afraid of in, in Protestant Scandinavia, of course, is to be stuck with the devil, and what you're afraid of is to be stuck with him. And so this is not a comment on British politics or British monarchy or anything, even though that picture may, may look like, like it. But, but I think we, you know, rather than thinking about who has it, who has Black Peter, we could be thinking about how it's moving around the table all the time. That even when we're not possessing Black Peter, we are thinking about or the old maid. When we're not possessing the old maid, we're still thinking about how it's moving around. So we should be more interested in the whole game of it. And not just who has it, um, and and this is also why I think that the effective term this is clearly not only about emotions. I think that if we only focuses on emotion, then we can again, you know, saying what well, the real archaeologists, like it's research, we're dealing with power, and then we have those who are interested in senses and emotions. I think it's it's uh, I think it's a strategy. So um, so I'd like to look at the fact in relation to curbstones and their use. But I have a problem with effect, and it's because English is not my first nor my second language. Um, I just I it, I had to translate it in, in six versions into into some Scandinavian, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian word before I found out that um, German is, is more close to, to a Scandinavian language. We would talk about the uh, Inwirkungskraft or Entwirkungskraft, and and so probably most of you read German. But but what is important here is how things work in on each other. So. I think you're lacking a word in English. Um, so, so I think that 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 helps us if we if we're thinking how things push in on each other. Um, so, I want to move the focus away from identifying actors towards examining how forces. Again, that's a very heavy word. Forces does it have to be that strong? And practices that work in on each other. So, finally, it's going to name in this useful language. Um, and so, and then I've also been rereading my Foucault, not through the just read Foucault again, and, um, and and got to the so if this is about power, then it takes at least two to tango. You, power is not something that is pushed down over your head. You've always well, if you're at least if you're a French existentialist, maybe uh, you can always commit suicide. So you don't have to be forced into all these. Uh, situations, um, and and I think Foucault very much took from from French existentialism. Um, so this agency has included this blame game uh, or passing the buck, who's responsible for the action. Um, I think that we can, maybe we should move towards talking about effects and effects, but also emphasize relationality. This is uh, not simply about emotions, but about how things work in on each other and how forces are brought into this. Um, so, and then I want to talk about curbstones. Um, some monuments in some places have really beautiful curbstones, right? Um, this is not what we'll be talking about now. Uh, it's just a bunch of stones, really. Um, Norwegian burial mounds from early and late Iron Age have perhaps some less delicate uh, curbstones. Here's uh, one from uh, St. Ness in south uh, western Norway, which is just to illustrate, uh, because the mound has been <coughs> Been, uh, removed first year, but uh, the rest of the example is from from eastern Norway. Um, uh, Viking Age graves is the largest prehistoric material we have in uh, from from uh, later prehistory, early uh, historic period, uh, an early historic period. It's six thousand graves from from Norway, um, and very few of these are found in large cemeteries. But there is an exception, and that is the region of Østfold, and in Østfold. Um, you have a few large cemeteries which has deep time, as in, as in deep time. Um, Hun and Storadal, which is two sites I'll show you um, in a second, they both uh, have a, a continuity from late Bronze Age to Viking Age. And when I talk about continuity, it's not you know being reinvented, but it's actually we have 
all faces represented. So it's a, it's a long continuity. This is uh, Hun. It contains no less than 145 visible <coughs> barrier mounts, of which 57 has been ex uh, examined archaeologically. But through our great topology, we can also say from, from the exterior structures that, that we have that continuity. Uh, so late Bronze Age, 1100 BC to 900 AD. And I'll look into the Western field here. And I would like to point out, and this is, this is a picture, I, I didn't bring a, a drawing from the excavation, so this is a picture of the reconstructed stupoid, which is, um, it's up top of the slope, it's one up here, it's one up here. <coughs> high up in the landscape, it's the biggest of the mounds up here. Um, and this, so it's a reconstruction of the curve zone, but with the same stones. Um, um, so it's uh, typical for the Roman period, though somewhat larger, and has this curve surrounding it. But it's located in one of the highest points in Nice, so you see this mount from, from afar and from some of the other mounts. And um, here are some of the not so great capstones. And then, um, I'll show you this great down here. So, firstly, lower in the terrain um, is uh, what they term the Viking grave. It's a, it's a 10th century grave, um, and it has nice curb. This is also reconstruction after excavation, um, it's excavated in the 1950s. And it's very clear, and the excavators also point out in the documenting it, they are copying stupoids. So they're, they're referencing Roman period mounts in, in, in general, but in particular to the other grave stupoid. Um, and, and it's obvious, and they can, they can see to it, and, and they are very similar. Now, let's just see what's inside stupoid. Inside stupoid, and, and so the Viking Age people, they wouldn't know what was in stupoid because they didn't excavate it. Um, there was a fingering of gold, there was spurs and spurs and with silver inlays. I'm sorry for that photo of the picture. And these are unique, you don't have them in the Roman Empire at all. The only place where you have Roman spurs is from this grave in the uh, Norway. Um, shield bars, spears, sword, to drinking horn, which is also quite sudden. So this belonged to the Lipsol graves, if you're into Roman period graves. So these, what is considered an elite group of graves. And so it's the first inhumation grave um, at the cemetery. Before that, it's only cremation. Um, so it's a, it's it changes. It's really a game changer this grave. And then we can look into um, to the Viking grave. Uh, it has uh, the the soil of the grave uh, contains rotten and dope um, and flint and pieces of pottery. This means that this must be settlement from migration period because uh, pottery come out of use in a way after the migration period. Um, and perhaps it's also a cleared away grave in addition, because there are uh, huge, uh, um, huge elements of burnt bone. Um, and, but the primary grave, uh, which uh, may have been located when the grave was removed, contains sword and shield buses, two spurs, which is pretty unusual, um, a vessel of uh, two drinking homes, is seldom a whetstone and the remains of Penal Road. And of course, they didn't know what was in the other grave. It's just really funny that with those 600 years apart and oral history for 600 years, that doesn't really work, does it? It doesn't. So, um, and just I, don't, I think due to time, I won't skip it into the second example from Stordale. It's pretty much the same. Um, but just want to point out that they are very interested in, in Roman period in the Viking Age. They have a good sense of chronology um, because they are interested in burlocks. And Elizabeth Arnold has identified a silver burlocks in uh, the Viking Age female grave, from which you saw another pendant before, um, which copies uh, Roman period uh, burlocks. And in another Viking Age grave uh, from Birka, J606, um, it did contain this little, sorry this little burlock from Roman period. So either you have heirlooms that lives on for a long time, so we really have some long relations, or they are, and they are, breaking into burial mounds as a, as a, as a frequent hobby in the Viking. Um, so, so still, but still that is also about creating relations in, in some manner. Okay, so we have uh, the temporal aspect, we have the long continuity in this less than ordinary place, I think, most of what I've read about effect theory has been interested in the ordinary effects. I think that's more important, but 
but I think in this case, I think something's going on, which at least I understand better if I'm thinking about effects. So I think also you know, the curbstones in themselves, they, if, if we were only to go for new materialism, they have some very obvious qualities. They're enduring and they're heavy and, and they limit uh, and they curb in. Um, but I think that doesn't leave us very long. But once we start thinking about this referencing and this kind of creation of relations, then I think it's it's a different it's a different games. But and they could not have known the content of these mounds unless there were a six hundred years tradition going on. Okay, so clearly they did not possess agency, but they the curbstones affected. <coughs> that was what was left the exterior of that grave. And they worked in on something. So their capacities are linked to their lasting abilities, uh, but they work on and with and influence humans constructing other mounds. Um, and this, so there's a, a, a temporality issue here, that something has been reinvented <coughs> or kept uh, for a long time. And and the curbstones become relevant for humans in the Viking Age. For some reason, they are, they are very acute. They live on through the reuse and reinterpretation of the, uh, these mounds, and I know that a reuse is, is never the same if we are to read Um So the relationship with the older graves through the use of curbstone elicits a sense of place, perhaps may have been part of, of place making, and the intersection between these bodies of stones and soils and their limiting curbstones and the humans creating new mounds with soils from former <coughs> sediments, including the squabble and boat. Uh, and the curbing of these mounds in um, included a reconfiguration of what was past and what was present. So the capacities of the, uh, of the pasts, can you say that? Pasts, uh, were materially present in the Viking Age. And I don't know who has the old mate in that game. Thank you.